Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate you coming out in this, uh, uh, on this rainy day for the declaration as a constitutional document during the early republic and thereafter. I am deeply grateful to the National Constitution Center, of course, uh, Jeff Rosen, that's president, Jen Kabanoff, and M Robin Morris. They've been absolutely wonderful throughout the course of the year or so that we've been in preparation for this, and this event could not have taken place with the many, many things that they uh, were involved in and helped me with. Let me just say a few brief words of introduction before welcoming our first panel. The Declaration of Independence remains one of the most influential legal documents in American history. To abolitionists, first wave feminists, labor organizations, and civil rights workers, the Declaration contained the key to understanding the Constitution's general welfare clause, its privileges or immunities, and privileges and immunities clause, as well as due process clauses. Yet in the last two decades, it has too infrequently been cited both in the academic writing and by courts, with most discussions about fundamental rights and deliberative democracy being focused on judicially constructed levels of scrutiny and other doctrines. This is an unfortunate oversight given the fundament, founding document's wealth of legally relevant clauses on matters like fundamental rights, representative governance, and judicial review. This symposium on how the Declaration of Independence should and does continue to influence the Constitution explores both the formal doctrine, uh, the formal document and its implications to prominent debates about originalism, living constitutionalism, theories about negative and positive liberties, as well as the extent to which written and unwritten constitutions should, should be an influence on our social and political rights. One key question for participants will be whether the Declaration is legally binding or a mere historical brief, an issue that has divided scholars. I won't announce everybody here. There are some very prominent people, constitutional scholars and historians, who will help shepherd us along the way today. The conference papers will be published in the South Cal uh, Southern California Law Review, and we're live streaming today, and that will be on YouTube or directly on the National Constitution website for those who are interested in it. When we, for, to take a look at how we explore the Declaration of Independence's current social and political implications to questions of constitutional interpretations. The overlapping subjects will also delve not only just at the substantive rights, but also the structural issues involved in constitutional decision making and our federalist system of governance. So thank you again for coming. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the National Constitution Center. It is great to see you all here. I am Jeff Rosen, the president of this superb institution. The National Constitution Center, for those of you who have not been here before, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And I am especially excited to host this distinguished scholarly symposium about the Declaration of Independence and the nation that followed. The relationship between the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights is one that we're centrally interested in exploring at the National Constitution Center. I hope very much that all of you here who have not yet visited it will go while you're here to our superb new uh, George H.W. Bush Gallery, which contains rare copies of the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. The stone Declaration of Independence commissioned by John Quincy Adams in 1820 because he was afraid that the original copy that was in the archives was fading and battered after the War of 1812 uh, and resulted in a more perfect copy than the one that's now in the archives itself. 
the first public printing of the Constitution, which was released in the Pennsylvania Packet newspaper, and because it was the first copy that we, the people of the United States, actually saw, some scholars consider it more constitutionally significant than the copy that's in the National Archives. And finally, one of the 12 surviving original copies of the Bill of Rights. George Washington sent out 13 to the states and one to the federal government. 12 survive, and this is one of those 12 original copies, uh, which you can see signed by John Adams as President of the Senate and of the Vice President of the United States, a draft that contains not 10 but 12 amendments, including the first two, which were not ratified, which have to do with congressional apportionment. And what the gallery tries to do, um, and what uh, this uh, riveting essay, which is the introduction to our new National Constitution Center Pocket Constitution tries to do, uh, is explore the relationship between the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, and describe how the rights that were promised in the Declaration are implicit in the Constitution and were finally codified in the Bill of Rights. I have to um, say also how exciting it is that this seminar follows a really quite extraordinary day that we had yesterday called Freedom Day, and we summon the heads of the top think tanks in America, of the American Enterprise Institute, the Cato Institute, the Aspen Institute, the Center for American Progress, and the ACLU to explore what the left, the right, and libertarians agree and disagree about the meaning of freedom. And what was so striking about yesterday's remarkably rich conversation is how often the Declaration of Independence and Natural Rights came up on both the left, uh, the right, and the libertarian side. Uh, people from uh, the heads of AEI to the head of Cato to the heads of the ACLU talked about our rights coming from God or nature and not government, talked about the moral foundation of American constitutionalism, and described how central that natural rights theory was to the framers themselves. So that's why it's so important today that we really have, that, well, not that we, that Alex, um, through his great energy, has summoned the most distinguished constitutional scholars in America to explore these central questions. Is the Declaration law? Uh, should it be cited in interpreting the Constitution? Is it moral or uh, aspirational? Uh, and so forth. These are crucial questions. Their contemporary relevance was signified dramatically by our discussion yesterday. And having these wonderful scholars to explore this uh, from a historical and philosophical perspective is invaluable. So I'm honored to moderate this first panel. Let me briefly introduce our great panelists, and then you will have the pleasure of hearing from them. Uh, Bernadette Myler is professor of law and Dean F. Johnson faculty scholar at Stanford. Uh, she studies British and American constitutional law, and her paper will explore a shift in interpreting the source of authority, not only of the Declaration itself, but also of the other founding era materials, including the US Constitution. Welcome, Bernadette. so much, uh, Jeff, and thank you to, especially to Alexander for inviting me to this symposium and also inviting me to think about the Declaration, which I've not devoted enough attention to previously. So I think that's a great function of this symposium that we're all getting together to think harder about the Declaration. My paper today is on the Declaration of Independence from the States to the Signers. Today, it's nearly impossible to separate our conception of the Declaration of Independence from the image of the signatures of the men who added their names to the document. A casual mention of John Hancock immediately conjures the clear picture of the most prominent such signature and has served widely as slang for a person's mark since the early 20th century. The OED's first attestation of the use in a similar fashion occurs uh, in a letter from author Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., not the, the justice, the, his father, to a friend in 1846. Dwelling on the propensity of the paper he was using to resist a signature and the availability of a further page to write it on, Holmes ended his letter, quote, modestly therefore, yet firmly, avoiding equally the pretentious boldness of John Hancock and the voluntary self-diminution of those who write their names in the circumference of the same sixpence which already covers a copy of the Lord's Prayer in full, I subscribe myself, yours very truly, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Here we see Holmes, a literary figure of some note and father of the justice, already dwelling in the mid-19th century on the visual aspects of Hancock's signature, what it might signify about the latter's character, and whether or not that character should provide a model for the ordinary American. 
But was this association of the Declaration so prominently with its signers, as though they served as a figure for the document itself, and even for the nascent American people, inevitable from the moment of the Declaration uh, itself? I want to begin to sketch an argument today suggesting that it was not. Instead, I contend, writers, writings begin to evince and generate a fascination with the signers and what they represent, particularly for the creation of a myth of the American people, beginning in the late 18-teens, more than 40 years after the de Declaration was promulgated. This emphasis countered and ultimately defeated a set of contrasting arguments manifested in treatises of constitutional law and arguments against the federal government in cases like Gibbons against Ogden, where Chief Justice Marshall ultimately established a broad definition of the kind of commerce that Congress could regulate under the US Constitution. At stake in the identification of the signers with the Declaration itself was, at this point, the political valence of the Declaration. Would it be a document supporting states' rights and the state's ability to nullify federal law? Or would it bolster arguments on behalf of national consolidation? Fleshing out the signers as iconic Americans served to make the Declaration available simultaneously for individual emulation and national myth-making. The Declaration thereby became a document for the whole people, for a people conceived as that of the nation together, not of the separate states. So what alternatives do we have to associating the signers with the authority of the Declaration? As Danielle Allen has recently emphasized in her book, Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence and Defense of Equality, the Declaration is a democratic document, by which she means that it's a product of group authorship. Thomas Jefferson composed a draft, and his responsibility for much of the text of the Declaration led many to view him as the voice behind the work. As many have shown, however, not only John Adams, but other voices in Congress intervened significantly in amending and composing the Declaration. Furthermore, Congress, quote, determined a title for its document on July 19th, not July 4th, once New York had joined in voting for independence. Congress then decided to call the document, quote, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. And at that point, sent it to be engrossed on parchment by Timothy Matlack, master calligrapher. It is instructive to pause for a moment to enumerate the four different official versions of the declaration that um, Allen identifies. So I'll just uh, read uh, her paragraph about this. All told, Congress placed four different orders for official copies of the Declaration. On July 4th, they had the Philadelphia printer John Dunlap produce a poster, which was then reproduced in newspapers throughout the colonies. They pasted this poster a broadside into their original record book for the date of July 4th. Then, on the 19th, they commissioned Matlack's manuscript. And later, when Congress produced a corrected journal of its proceedings, that the Secretary Thompson gave us a second handwritten but official declaration. Finally, in January of 1777, Congress placed its fourth order. It resolved that, quote, an authenticated copy of Declaration of Independency with the names of the members of Congress subscribing the same be sent to each of the United States and that they, the states, be desired to have the same put on record. This final job was given to a Baltimore printer named Mary Catherine Goddard, Baltimore's postmaster since 1775, who was described by a contemporary as, quote, an expert and correct compositor of types. So <clears throat> focusing on the second instead of the fourth version of the document might generate a significantly different vision of the Declaration's authority. In particular, the prominence of the title, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America in the second version, lays the emphasis on the state's decision undergirding independence. The fourth document, with appended signatures, instead draws the eye to a collection of individuals not explicitly divided by state, although spatially grouped according to such affiliation. In a 1962 piece on the changing reputation of the Declaration of Independence, Philip Detweiler explained early partisan debates about the document. Thomas Jefferson's authorship called the work into question for Federalists, and it was instead championed by the Anti-Federalists. Detweiler concludes that after the War of 1812, quote, the disintegration of the Federalist Party and the rejection of their political ideology by a new generation of Americans assured the dominance of the Jeffersonian Republican views of the Declaration. He then cites to the burgeoning of historical, literary, and painterly interest in the subject beginning in the later 18-teens. What his account neglects, however, is the continuing dispute about the sources for authority of the Declaration, ones that played out not only on the popular but also on the constitutional stage. 
In both state and federal Supreme Courts, a number of cases from the late 18th century through Gibbons v. Ogden in 1824 furnished a strain of argument supporting the state authority for the Declaration and the necessity of the states as undergirding, undergirding independence. Hence, uh, Judge uh, St. George Tucker in the Virginia case of Camper against Hawkins elaborated a claim for the nature of the Virginia Constitution as higher law that drew upon the relationship between it and the state's ability to declare independence. By the time of Gibbons v. Ogden, the state's Declaration of Independence has, for the lawyer representing New York, come to stand for the limitations of federal authority under a government of enumerated powers. The case report elaborates, quote, Mr. Oakley for the respondent stated that there were some general principles applicable to the subject which might be assumed or it had been settled by the decisions of this court and which had acquired the force of maxims of political law. Among these was the principle that the states do not derive their independence and sovereignty from the grant or concession of the British Crown, but from their own act in the Declaration of Independence. By this act, they became free and independent states and as such have full power to, power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may have right do. The state of New York, having thus become sovereign and independent, formed a constitution by which the supreme legislative power was vested in the legislature. And there are no restrictions on that power which in any way re manner relate to the present controversy. On the other hand, the Constitution of the United States is one of limited and expressly delegated powers. The national constitution must therefore be construed strictly as regards the powers expressly granted and the objects to which those powers are to be applied. Oakley's rhetoric of strict construction, which might seem oddly futuristic coming from the 1820s, connects with the views of John Taylor of Caroline, a Virginian politician and writer who listed among his works construction construed and constitutions vindicated from 1820, and new views on the Constitution of the United States from 1823. In Construction Construed, a work manifestly opposed to a notion of construction that would enlarge the powers of the federal government, Taylor relied heavily on a reading of the Declaration of Independence and on that document as undergirding a political theory of natural rights as opposed to sovereignty. And we heard Jeff just talk about how uh, natural freedom is a, a rhetoric that's used even today. Um, comparing the rights of property with those of freedom of religion and deploring that the former have not yet been protected in his view as rigorously as the latter under the American mode of government, Taylor tries to bolster these against federal encroachment. Although he ultimately turns to the states as the only place where sovereignty might be reposed within the American system, Taylor begins by suggesting that sovereignty itself as a concept belongs primarily with the history of monarchs, including the oppressive Stuart Kings, and has no place within a system authorized by the people. He particularly abhors any notion of divided sovereignty, but he maintains generally that, quote, neither the Declaration of Independence nor the federal constitution nor the constitution of any single state uses this equivocal and illimitable word. In this context, he emphasizes that the Declaration of Independence, quote, declares the colonies to be free and independent states. In his later new views of the Constitution of the United States, Taylor elaborates further on the stakes of his interpretation of the Declaration and the role of the states therein, here conceding to the rhetoric of sovereignty. So here he says, um, in order to determine whether the United States meant by the term union to establish a supreme power or a limited association, we must commence our inquiry at their political birth and accommodate our arguments with the principles they avowed in proclaiming their political existence. They are stated in the Declaration of Independence. We, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, fr are free and independent states. And that is free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, et cetera. Such is the origin of liberty and the foundation of our form of government. The consolidating project ingeniously leaves unexamined the arguments suggested by this declaration and commences its lectures at the end of the subject to be considered. So uh, here he's, uh, he's uh, and then he says, um, the word united is used in conjunction with the free and independent states, and this association recognizes a compatibility between the sovereignty and the union of the several states. Taylor's later works on the Constitution bolster the arguments being made against decisions of the Marshall Court from the Bank case, McCulloch, to Gibbons itself, and associate states' rights 
with the opposite of an expansive construction, hence with what he calls strict construction. Around the same time, in 1820, John Sanderson began publication of a series of nine books, only writing the first few himself, entitled Biography of the Signers to the Declaration of Independence. The first book is almost entirely devoted to a lengthy introduction, which a contemporary review condemned as verbose, digressive, and repetitive. The introduction takes upon itself, however, an important project, that of justifying engaging in biography of the signers at this moment. The seemingly digressive episodes actually contribute substantially to that justification. Several aspects of the introduction are worth noting in this regard. First, it furnishes a somewhat lengthy history of the colonies before the revolution, but it focuses on pre-revolutionary efforts at establishing um, unity and British opposition to those measures, thus bolstering a national theory of American history. Second, it laments the lesser status of American literature as compared with European precedents, yet simultaneously suggests that the heroes of the Declaration can become the mythic precedents for an American literary canon. Finally, it emphasizes the feelings animating early Americans and the role of sentiment in establishing the new nation. At the conclusion of the introduction, Sanderson furnishes a transcript of the Declaration, omitting, of course, the title, The Unanimous Declaration of the 13 States, then includes a list of signatures, now no longer grouped by state, but simply enumerated. Rather than simply emerging out of a new, nonpartisan spirit of appreciation for the Declaration and its heritage, this biography of the signers and similar works staked out a position in the contest over whose politics the Declaration supported. Countering the view of those opposed to broad construction of federal powers under the Constitution, Sanderson and those writing alongside him created instead a new national myth of the Declaration, one in which the individual and the federal government would be harmoniously blended. That the Declaration is now so intimately entwined with our image of its signers is a mark of their success. Thank you. One or two questions, because uh, the presentation was so provocative. So you've uh, painted a vision of Taylor and Oakley as conceiving of the people of the several states rather than the people of the United States as being sovereign. James Wilson took a different view and said that it was we the people of the United States that were sovereign, and Lincoln embraced Wilson's view, and I guess that was settled after Appomattox, that it was we the people of the United States who were sovereign. But to tell us about the degree to which the Taylor and Oakley view was central to the debates over secession. Did, did people rely on the Declaration as justification for the state's ability to secede? So I think that's a fascinating um, question. I, my research so far has mostly gone through the 1820s, but, oh, sorry. Uh, I, sorry. <laughs> um, my research so far has mostly taken me through the 1820s, but I have looked a little bit at um, Justice Taney's rhetoric um, in the pre-Civil War cases and also um, some of his writings where he does invoke the Declaration uh, fairly substantively and I think in service of a state's rights view. So that would support a notion that, um, and so Taney is you know, one of the crucial uh, justices uh, who is being kind of overturned by the Civil War. Um, so I, I think that would support a notion that um, in the moments leading up to the Civil War that the Declaration is still um, considered to be a document that would support a state's rights account, so yeah. And my second question is about natural rights and incorporation. If the framers believed, as they did, that these rights come from God and not government, wouldn't the federal government, as well as the straight states, be constrained from violating them? And as evidence, I guess I'd ask you about the amendment that Madison considered the most important in the bunch that he proposed and wasn't adopted, which would have prohibited the federal government, as well as the states, from abridging the rights of conscience speech and trial by jury. So, so did, did the people think that uh, natural rights bound the federal government? I, I think definitely uh, some people thought that natural rights bound the federal government. Um, but I think what's interesting to me is that um, uh, Taylor's views seem to be more about rights as against powers, um, whereas some of the 
uh, federalist accounts are more about uh, talking about the various powers of government, right? So I think he's even reluctant to concede that there would be any sovereignty in the states because he's worried that sovereignty is going to go too far, that the source of sovereignty in the natural rights of the people is going to be lost. Um, so that uh, natural rights, in a sense, is opposed to any forms of sovereignty under his account. So final question. So under his account, the states, as well as the federal governments, are governments of limited powers because when we move from the state of nature to civil society, we surrender only certain rights to secure the greater security and safety of the rights retained. It was a very limited notion of, of power. Exactly, right. And he keeps emphasizing that the people are the ultimate source of power so that it's easier maybe for them to police the regulation of government in on the state level because they're closer to it, but still he's suspicious of any claims of sovereignty even on the part of states. Superb. Well, the head of the Cato Institute, uh, who was here yesterday, would be thrilled by this presentation. <laughs> would be relieved to hear that uh, how limited uh, natural rights theory made the states as well as the feds. Thank you for that really great uh, presentation. Uh, next up, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Daryl Miller. He is a professor of law at Duke University School of Law. His scholarship focuses on civil rights, constitutional law, and civil procedure. And his paper will argue that the Declaration of Independence is not constitutional law as conventionally understood, but instead is what Richard Primus has called a continuity tender. Daryl, welcome. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Alex uh, for getting us all together today and for you uh, coming out on this rainy morning to come um, hear some uh, scholarship and uh, thoughts on the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So my paper um, uh, is entitled The Declaration of Independence is a Continuity Tender. At least that's the uh, title right now. Um, and I want to say uh, this. Uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence moral calculus uh, is simple. Indeed, it is, quote, self-evident. If law insufficiently protects freedom and equality, then revolution is justified. This is the mathematics of heaven, of, quote, nature and nature's God. This is the music of the spheres. But as a matter of American law, I want to suggest that the Declaration's moral calculus that I just described predicts nothing and proves nothing. It is a description of a political crisis, it is an expression for an act of creation. It is not an algorithm for governance. It is a formula in the original sense of that word, quote, a form of words used in a ceremony or ritual. I want to suggest the Declaration of Independence is not law as conventionally understood, but is instead a form of what Richard Primus has termed a continuity tender quote, an inherited ritual formula that one repeats to affirm a connection to one's predecessors, not to endorse the content of that statement as one's predecessors originally understood it or how one imagines they understood it. The Declaration of Independence is a predicate for certain types of lawmaking, but it's not law itself, as I will discuss. It seems strange to have to argue that the Declaration of Independence is not law. It is such a canonical piece of American uh, mythology, uh, something like 80% of Americans think that the phrase all men are created equal is actually in the Constitution. But a moment's thought, it's apparent that the full 1,337 or 8, depending on how you count, words that make up the Declaration of Independence is not law. It is a majestic piece of literature. It's great advocacy. Uh, it place, in places it's a stirring statement of the Ameri American creed, but it's not law. It's not written as law. It was not intended to be law. It's not enforced as law. The Declaration of Independence is primarily a lawyer's brief. It is offered to a court of political opinion, a court whose unwritten judgments, while momentous, are non-binding. The entire first two paragraphs of the Declaration, despite their eloquence, are prefatory. They are claims about why it is necessary to even make this argument. They have the ring of an opening statement. The bulk of the Declaration of Independence is, in fact, a set of, quote, facts introduced to, quote, prove. 
to, quote, a candid world. Why a nation uh, that has slaveholders has a moral right to resist their oppressors. Reading the Declaration of Independence in light of the fact that a substantial portion of the signers were in fact slaveholders reminds me of the chestnut from the English intellectual Samuel Johnson, who at the outset of the revolution remarked, quote, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? Indeed, as a former slave and prominent abolitionist Frederick Douglass would note over 70 years later, to the actual slave, the founding father's generation's justification for the rebellion appeared trite at best and hypocritical at worst. Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, three black men who led slave rebellions didn't need a written declaration the moral calculus of their rebellions was self-evident. Nor is there any consensus either by the signers who agreed with its sentiments to treat the declaration as law. No one thought that there was enough legal content in the Declaration of Independence to organize a nation. Uh, that is exhibited by the fact that shortly thereafter we have the Articles of Confederation, which of course failed, and then the 1787 Constitution, which we have today as amended. In fact, according to the late historian Pauline Mayer, it seems to have been mostly forgotten, except solely as a memorial of independence for at least a decade and a half after its adoption. Lastly, the Declaration of Independence is not treated as law by courts, as legions of pro se litigants have found out. Let me give you a sampler of lower court opinions. This is one from the federal court in New Hampshire, you know, the live free or die place. The Declaration, of this quote, the Declaration of Independence does not give rise to a private right of action to enforce the, quote, unalienable rights it describes. Here's one from the District of Maine. We have no jurisdiction over claims allegedly rising under the Declaration of Independence. I personally cannot think of a single case in which the federal court has struck down a duly enacted piece of legislation on the ground that it violates the Declaration of Independence. As Justice Scalia has said, quote, the Declaration of Independence is not a legal prescription conferring powers upon courts. So, if it's not written as law, and if it's not intended as law, and if it's not treated as law, then what is its function and what is its appeal? Why have persons as different as Confederate Jefferson Davis, Abraham Lincoln, black civil rights marches of the 60s, and neo-Confederates of today, all appeal to the Declaration to support their particular viewpoint. And I think that this is where Richard Primus's idea of a continuity tender provides some answer. A continuity tender, again, as Primus defines it, is, quote, an inherited ritual formula that one repeats to affirm a connection to one's predecessors, not to endorse the content of the statements as one predecessors originally understood it, or how one imagines they understood it. Primus offers the example of a continuity tender from the United Kingdom. So in the UK, all laws are, uh, begin with the formulation, be it enacted by the Queen's most excellent majesty. And all laws have to receive the Queen's assent, although no one, not the Parliament, not the Queen, no one thinks that the Queen possesses any authority to actually refuse her assent. In other words, it is a formula, it is a ritual, it is a performance the only purpose of which is to show that the present generation's act of lawmaking is part of an unbroken lineage with past generations of British subjects. And the ritual formulaic aspects of the Declaration of Independence are apparent. Everybody cites it to advance their normative goals. When the Confederacy began, a rebellion that goes to the very heart of the treason clause of the United States Constitution, they cited the Declaration of Independence as authority for their actions. Roger Taney looked to the Declaration of Independence to see who could be the people who possess constitutional rights. And of course, according to Taney, uh, Taney did not include uh, African Americans or their descendants. Lincoln looked at the same document and said Taney, Taney had it all wrong, not because there was something in the Constitution that made it wrong, but because the Declaration by its own terms did not separate out African Americans from uh, its moral sentiment. And of course, Martin Luther King Jr., nearly 100 years later, used the Declaration in his I Have a Dream speech 
stating that when the framers of the declaration uh, wrote the declaration, quote, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was their full, their full, full heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But these are moral appeals for other types of lawmaking, not appeals to make the Declaration enforceable in and of itself. I want to suggest that the Declaration of Independence is, again, a continuity tender that makes certain types of lawmaking possible. So if the Declaration is a predicate to certain types of lawmaking, what kind of lawmaking is predicated on the continuity tender? Well, the Declaration of Independence makes possible that type of law that repudiates one set of established and entrenched traditions and norms in favor of another set of norms, but with a common understanding and acceptance that no change in tradition has in fact occurred, when in fact it has. The Declaration of Independence is how one bridges the generations when there is a serious gap in the lived experience of the nation. For example, the Declaration of Independence uh, is used as continuity tender to suggest, despite all the counterexamples, that the Constitution was not a pro-slavery document. The 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, simply recognizes what has been understood all along, that all men are endowed by the Creator with liberty. The Declaration of Independence is voiced not to empower judges to abolish slavery on that naked natural law statement in the Declaration, but to perpetuate the illusion that the 13th Amendment is what the founding generation, to which we are all heirs, contemplated all along. The Declaration forms a continuity between the founding generation and the much different post-Civil War society. It rebalances the law value of that equation that I talked about at the beginning of my remarks to make law equal to freedom. So too with the 14th Amendment, it's a continuity tender to put in place that all men are created equal value of the Declaration. Not the Declaration statement itself becomes law, but to allow the expression in the Constitution to do so. Again, it makes law equal to equality. This happens not only at the level of constitutional law, I would argue, but also particular types of what uh, William Eskridge has called super statutes. That is, statutes that have such a deep resonance with our values uh, that they take on quasi-constitutional character. Uh, that's uh, Eskridge's sort of formulation. So it, when uh, Martin Luther King uses the declaration in his I Have a Dream speech uh, to propel the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, he is doing so as a continuity tender because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is an act which repudiates deeply held traditions and claims of rights about private property on the assumption that the Civil Rights Act is a more true expression of the founding generation's understanding of property rights than the modern Southern segregationist, even though nobody thinks that's in fact true. I want to emphasize that the idea here of continuity tenders is on law making. It is intelligible to say that the 13th Amendment is law facilitated by a continuity with the Declaration, so too with the 14th Amendment. Although the ritualized aspect of the continuity tender becomes more exposed in ordinary legislation like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it's still meaningful to say that the act of legislation is an appeal of continuity with the founders. Why I emphasize the lawmaking aspect uh, of uh, the Declaration as a continuity tender uh, is that uh, we have to deal with that last portion of this equation, right? That revolution is justified if the law does not sufficiently protect liberty or equality. The right to alter or abolish government uh, language of the Declaration. To use a cosmological metaphor, Violent revolution is kind of the event horizon of lawmaking. It exists, but once you get past it, you're at the point of no return as far as lawmaking goes. To dissolve a government with force is not a justiciable act. It's not an act of lawmaking at all. It is not a continuity tender, but a discontinuity. The appeal to uh, the right to alter or abolish government by violent means cannot be a continuity tender because a continuity tender depends on everybody understanding that what is happening is a ritual and a formula. 
A violent revolution makes what is understood as a ritual and formula into a real experience is what Richard Primus has called the weaponization of a continuity tender. So as the Haitian rebels uh, during the um, revolution in Haiti that created uh, the, the country of Haiti uh, might say, the act of altering or abolishing a government vi violent means may be moral, uh, it may be necessary, but it's not lawmaking. And although many people, including some Supreme Court justices, sort of identify this strain, uh, for example, in the Heller or McDonald cases, the implication is that whatever moral content there is to a revolution in this equation has cannot be separately plugged into any other formula. The revolution value of the Declaration of Independence is always the dependent variable. Indeed, uh, what I suggest is that the revolutionary value of the Declaration of Independence is the product of the invocation of the continuity, continuity tender itself for ordinary lawmaking. It is revolutionary to say that property rights in men and women are abolished. It is revolutionary to say that persons born in the United States are citizens of the state where they reside and of the United States. It is revolutionary to say that shopkeepers must serve all comers. But it is the kind of revolution that continuity tenders make possible a revolution of law, not of might. Thank you. Thank you for that fascinating presentation. And I understand the argument that uh, the Declaration as a continuity tender provides the basis for super statutes like the Civil Rights Act and for the 13th and 14th Amendment. But I want to ask you more about the legal status of natural rights. So the framers really did believe, as you said, that when government becomes subversive of unalienable rights, it's the right and duty of pe people to alter and abolish it. Imagine that uh, the people, uh, the Constitutional Convention passed an amendment saying this Constitution shall be unamendable and can never be altered and abolished. Wouldn't that be a violation of the unalienable right to alter and abolish government? And might that uh, not be ju judicially enforceable? Give it a try. Can you hear me okay? Yep, it works well. Right. Uh, well, it did actually. If you, uh, you know, no, no state can lose its separate, um, you know, its representation in, in the Senate without its consent, and no amendment actually has that effect. Uh, it was unamendable, unamendable uh, with respect to the slave, well, it actually has to do with Congress, but the implication was about the slave trade up into 1807. Um, so there are portions actually of the Constitution that are, you know, unamendable. Um, I think, you know, you know, we're having a very sort of high level discussion about, well, what is law? What's the source of law? Is it a positive uh, notion of law? Is it a natural notion of law? And I think some evidence, uh, at least about the way I think about it, can come from the, um, the story of the ratification of the, the 13th Amendment itself, right? So the ratification, or the, the proposal of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, uh, was opposed um, by um, members of Congress and others who said, essentially, you can't abolish slavery through a constitutional amendment because that's unconstitutional. Right? that essentially it violates all the sort of natural rights and property and all these other things that we talked about. And you know what? We did it, right? And so not only is this an abolition of slavery um, in, in, the, you know, in, the, in the sort of natural rights sense, but also in a very much in a positive sense, right? So it is a repudiation of a certain type of um, understanding of the Constitution outside the Constitution. Uh, the, the natural light, natural rights norms that uh, aren't encoded in the Constitution itself. Might a counter argument be that people were disagreeing at the time of the 13th about what the content of natural rights were and not viewing property as an unalienable uh, right, but uh, instead viewing equality as more of one? Uh, so, I'm sorry, the counter argument is, I, I lost the thread of the... That, that, that essentially the debate over the 13th Amendment was a debate over what the content of natural rights were. And I can understand that, right? But then the question is, if that's what we're doing, then why write it out, right? If, if you're going to have a system of law, right, that, um, that traffics in natural, natural law, 
then why write then not, why write anything other than as uh, I mean one argument would be well this is how we reflect what our prior sentiments are about natural rights but um, you know we live in a scriptorial culture and we tend to prioritize things that are written over other types of norms and so to the extent that you know slavery is abolished through a, a writing um, then that becomes law doesn't mean it's it, you know there's been arguments I've heard that um, that you couldn't repeal the 13th Amendment you know if we had a you know if for whatever reason we had a constitutional convention um, and somebody decided, you know what, slavery actually was a pretty good idea and property rights are really good and people and decided to come back with it. Um, there might be moral arguments to say exactly what you said, that you know, this, this violates some sort of natural rights. Um, but then I think we're operating on a different plane. We're not operating on lawmaking plane, we're operating on you know, a natural rights plane in which everything is up for grabs. One more uh, question. We've created this really exciting interactive, which you can look at in the Bill of Rights Gallery and online, where you can click on any provision of the Bill of Rights and see its historical antecedents in the revolutionary or state constitutions. And natural rights were so central to the Bill of Rights, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which you mentioned, which both Jefferson and Madison had at their sides when they drafted the Declaration and the Bill of Rights was crucial. Madison proposed an unaccepted amendment that was basically the preamble to the Virginia Declaration, which mm -hmm. set out the right of revolution and the right of people to alter and abolish government. So given that centrality, maybe the answer, might the answer to your question be, they wrote it down only reluctantly, and indeed Madison originally didn't want a Bill of Rights because he feared that by writing stuff down, people might assume if the rights weren't written down, they weren't protected. So it was for greater security and safety of the rights that were retained, as the anti-federalists claimed, but by no means did it mean to be exclusive or to displace the independent legal status of natural law. Well, I mean, I, I, again, we're sort of back to the debate about the independent legal status so that I can, you know, the, the idea is that uh, I can go out as an officer of the court, for example, and pluck, you know, out of a you know a non-textual source, um, something that says this is uh, a set of behaviors that's incumbent on you to to follow in some sense. You know, we had that kind of you know arguments, um, and and sometimes they were deployed for good purposes, right? And sometimes they were deployed for bad purposes, right? The same natural law um, that uh, supports the 13th Amendment is the same natural law that the Confederacy used to support secession. Um, so if, you know, if we have no, if we have no vantage point at, uh, from which to, dis you know, to make a determination as between which one is right, just by the mere assertion, then we're back to positive notions of law. That law is what we all sort of agree as a, you know, as a polity uh, to accept as law. Wonderful. Thank you. Th thanks for all that. Uh, finally, in this superb trio, we have Lee Strang, who's Professor of Law and Director of Faculty Research at Toledo College of Law. He's published widely in Constitutional Law, Property Law, Religion, and the First Amendment, and he will argue that from an originalist perspective, the Declaration should not be considered part of the Constitution. Welcome, Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Setsis and the National Center for organizing and hosting the symposium. I have to say shamefacedly that my family and I have never been to Philadelphia and we've never been to Liberty Hall even though I teach about the Constitution. And so I've resolved after coming here that we are going to come here this fall. Uh, thank you in advance for your comments and suggestions. The title of my talk is Originalism's Subject Matter. The Declaration of Independence is not part of the subject matter of constitutional interpretation. Let me give you a little bit of background. About seven years ago, I published an article where I argued that, from an originalist perspective, the Declaration did not possess a unique role in constitutional interpretation. And I provided a whole bunch of different reasons showing the Declaration did not have a privileged role. For example, I made the kind of unexceptional argument that the Declaration couldn't be the interpretive key because it's inconsistent with the Constitution in many areas. And we've heard different points already this morning that, that supports that proposition. My position then and now remains that the Declaration is an important source of information about the written Constitution's original meaning, but in principle, it's no different than any other source of the original meaning. 
And so in this essay, what I want to do is provide an additional argument that the Declaration does not have a unique interpretive role. And in doing so, I hope to fill a gap in the literature. And the gap is, what is the focus of originalist interpretation? Originalists, I think, assume that the focus is the written constitution, but I want to bring out that facet, make it express, and justify it. And then in doing so, I want to use it as an opportunity to respond to what I think is a powerful counterpoint to originalism. And that criticism is that originalism is incorrect because it's inconsistent with much of our constitutional practice, which the critics argue is normative, and which includes more than just the written constitution. So my thesis this morning is that originalism's subject matter that which originalism interprets does not include the Declaration. Instead, the subject matter is and is only the, doc the document in the National Archives beginning, We the People, along with canonical amendments. And so the Declaration is a rich data source, but it itself is not the subject of interpretation. I'm going to make three moves this morning to support that proposition. First, I'm going to argue that originalism's own conceptual commitments identify the written Constitution as the sole subject matter of interpretation. Second, I'll argue that both important and widespread facets of American constitutional practice support originalism's description about what the Constitution is. Third, I'll offer briefly a thicker jurisprudential argument that the written Constitution is the sole focus of interpretation. And this thicker account adds a controversial jurisprudential claim about law's nature taken from the Aristotelian philosophical tradition. So my first argument, Originalism's conceptual commitments identify only the written constitution as the subject matter of interpretation. And I look at four key commitments that originals have made. First, the key commitment to the constitution's original meaning. Second, to the doctrine of accepting some non-originalist precedent. Third, accepting the existence of something called constitutional construction, which I'll explain. And then third, the normative justifications that originalists have offered in support of originalism. All of these, I say, point to the constitution being only the written constitution. So first, originalism's focus and privileging of the text's original meaning. And this privileging cashes out in two main ways. The first is called the fixation thesis, and that's just the fancy word for the widespread originalist view that the Constitution's text's meaning was fixed when it was framed and ratified. So only the Constitution went through the framing and ratification process, and therefore only its text's meaning was fixed through that ratification process. And the reason why that's the important time for fixation is because the components of, a, of the Constitution's communicative content, for example, its uh, context, the rules of syntax, those are time dependent. And so the relevant time frame is the framing and ratification period. The second facet of the, fi of the Constitution's, uh, of originalism's focus on the original meaning is called the constraint principle. The constraint principle is the commonly accepted originalist view that the Constitution's original meaning constrains whatever the resulting constitutional doctrine is. And so it means that any resulting constitutional doctrine must be at least consonant with the Constitution's determinate original meaning. And so putting together this fixation thesis, fixed at the time of framing and ratification, with the constraint principle, any doctrine has to be consonant with that fixed meaning, shows that the written Constitution is the sole source, the exclusive factor, that determines constitutional doctrine. Because if other doctrines or other practices or documents were potentially part of the Constitution, then they could override that fixed, constraining original meaning. The second commitment that originalism makes is to constitutional construction. And that depends on a distinction between, on the one hand, interpretation, and on the other hand, construction. So interpretation is where the Constitution's original meaning determines one right answer in a legal case. As an example, it's determinatively the case that Congress has the Commerce Clause authority to regulate interstate commercial transportation of goods and services on railroads. Construction, by contrast, is where the Constitution's original meaning, it doesn't give one right answer. It may narrow down the range of possible answers, but it doesn't determine the outcome of a case. And in that so-called construction zone, interpreters, including judges, possess discretion to create, to construct constitutional doctrine. Now, the resulting doctrine has to be consistent with what we know about the original meaning, but it's not determined by, it's not coterminous with, the original meaning. Originalism's acceptance of constitutional construction is dependent on originalism's prior commitment to the primacy of the determinate original meaning. Construction occurs only when the original meaning is exhausted because when the original meaning is determinate, following the fixation thesis and constraint principle, which I identified earlier, the written constitution's original meaning should govern. Third, looking at non-originalist precedent. 
Some originalists accept the continued existence of some non-originalist precedent. A lot of originalists exclude the continued viability of non-originalist precedent. And both of these groups of originalists, regardless of their position, do so because of the primacy of the written constitution. So for those originalists that accept the continued viability of some non-originalist precedent, such as myself, we do so because of the original meaning's prior commitment to the written constitution. And in particular, Article Three authorizes federal judges to exercise judicial power, and the original meaning of judicial power in Article Three is that federal judges should give significant respect to constitutional precedent, including non-originalist precedent. Now, for those originalists who reject all non-originalist precedent, they do so through a similar line of thought. They ground their conclusion in the written constitution status as the supreme law of the land. They argue that only the written constitution is the supreme law of the land, and so any Supreme Court decisions contrary to the Constitution are void under the Supremacy Clause. Therefore, regardless of, your, of the originalist perspective on, on, on precedent, on non-originalist precedent, both camps identify the written Constitution as the sole subject matter for interpretation. Fourth, originalist arguments in favor, normative arguments in favor of originalism push strongly in favor of identifying the written Constitution as the sole subject matter of interpretation. Originalists have been busy for the last 15 years, it's kind of a cottage industry, describing why the original meaning is the most normatively attractive theory of interpretation. And, and, and the ideas range from popular sovereignty, we've heard a lot about natural rights, good consequences, and human flourishing. And these normative commitments of originalists have an influence on the ultimate originalist theory. And the written constitution is the linchpin for each of these different justifications. And I'll just, because of time constraints, focus on one, one that I think is frankly, when I do debates and talks, the most popular, and that's the argument from natural rights. And this argument's most popularly associated with Randy Barnett, who's argued that originalism best protects natural rights, and it does so through a two-step process. First, the Constitution's original meaning is, I don't think he would say uniquely, but very rights protective. And it's very rights protective both because the original meaning itself protects natural rights, but also because the Constitution contains its own interpretive keys, its own rules of construction in the Ninth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause that also suggest rights protectiveness. Barnett's second move is to say that interpreters must utilize originalism to lock in the original meaning's rights protectiveness. And it's the written Constitution that it, upon which Barnett's theory focuses, because without the document's writtenness, the locking in of original meaning's rights protectiveness would be undermined. For instance, if judges could utilize other documents or other meanings to craft constitutional doctrine, they could deviate from the written constitution's rights protective original meaning and thereby undermine natural rights. So my first argument is originalism's own commitment say the written constitution is the only game in town. My second move, which is uh, conceitedly more controversial, is that both important and widespread facets of our constitutional practice support originalism's identification of the written constitution as the sole subject matter of interpretation. My argument is that our constitutional practice, as exemplified by the actions of key governmental officials, supports originalism's description of the constitution. And then at the end of this, of this subpart, what I'm gonna do is argue that even if some practices do not support originalism's position, and uh, not give anything away, there are those, the importance, ubiquity, and normative attractiveness of the practices that do support originalism suggests that these divergent practices should be labeled mistakes. So first, the written constitution. All members of our practice acknowledge that at least part of the constitution is the written constitution, and the written constitution itself identifies the written constitution as the sole subject matter of interpretation. In particular, things known as constitutional indexicals show that only the written constitution is the subject matter of interpretation. Indexicals are the constitution's texts, identifications of what the constitution is. So think of the preamble. The preamble says that it is part of a document which is this constitution. And these indexicals also identify that the written constitution, and only it, is the most authoritative legal norm in our legal system, thinking to the Article VI Supremacy Clause, which identifies this constitution, the same one, as the supreme law of the land. In fact, this written constitution focus of our legal practice is so pervasive that non-originalists regularly lament the fact that prominent actors in our practice publicly 
though in the non-originalist eyes falsely, claim and justify their decisions with reference to the written Constitution. So think back to the different Supreme Court nominations we've had. And so one would expect the conservative justices to say the written Constitution made me do it, but the lament is why are the progressive justices making that same argument? Second, the existence of constitutional amendments also shows that the written Constitution is the sole subject of interpretation. And it does so by identifying constitutional amendments as having the authority to displace other facets of our legal practice, such as Supreme Court precedent. So for example, the 11th Amendment abrogated Chisholm versus George's misinterpretation of Article III. Third, our practice identifies the Constitution by its provenance. The document that is the focal case of our constitutional practice is identified because only it came out of Philadelphia and was ratified by state conventions thereafter. No matter how much more normatively attractive another document is, it's not the Constitution if it didn't go through that framing and ratification process. And this provenance identifies only one document, the document in the National Archives that begins with the people, as our Constitution. Fourth, all federal officers take an oath that identifies the written Constitution as the sole subject matter of constitutional interpretation. All officers take an oath to support only the Constitution of the United States, which is the same Constitution, beginning of the US Code, titled the Constitution of the United States. So consequently, the key gatekeeping mechanism for government officials who authoritatively interpret the Constitution binds those officials to the written Constitution. Fifth, Supreme Court practice identifies the written Constitution as the subject matter of interpretation in at least seven ways. I know you're thinking, oh my gosh, this guy can go through seven ways. No, what I'll do is I'll just briefly describe the common thread. And the common thread that runs through the Supreme Court's practices is its prioritization of the written Constitution over other sources of law, including its own precedent. And this includes, for example, when the Supreme Court explains its rulings as being required by the written Constitution. The Supreme Court justifies changes to its constitutional doctrine based on the written Constitution. The Supreme Court defends even its most controversial decisions, so think of the controversial decisions regarding gun control or abortion or same-sex marriage as required by the written Constitution. The Supreme Court, even when it's really implausible, even where people are saying, do they really mean this, points to the written Constitution as the reason for its actions. And this is actually my favorite part, where uh, Dickerson versus U.S. was decided in, in the year 2000, and it, was the, it was the, uh, had the potential to overrule Miranda versus Arizona. And even though the Supreme Court had repeatedly stated, repeatedly reasoned, repeatedly held that Miranda was not constitutionally required, and in fact by Chief Justice, by then Justice Rehnquist himself, in Dickerson, the Chief Justice cagely claimed that Miranda announced a constitutional rule, that it was a constitutional decision, that it was constitutionally based, that it was constitutionally required. So even, even though it was very implausible, he still felt the need to publicly defend the decision based on the Constitution. The Supreme Court also subordinates other forms of argument to the written Constitution, even when it would be plausible to use these other forms of argument. And just to give you a little bit of understanding what I'm trying to say, in the recent NLRB versus Noel Canning case, it dealt with what counted as a recess of the Senate. The administration argued that the, that the court should, should utilize a longstanding tradition to displace the written Constitution, and the court wouldn't have anything of it. Instead, what the court did was a two-step move that what counted as recess of the Senate was ambiguous, and then utilizing an original methods method of interpretation looked at the longstanding constitutional practice as a way to liquidate the ambiguity in the text. Sixth, dissenting justices appeal routinely to the written constitution against existing doctrine, and uh, neither the Supreme Court nor its justices, to my knowledge, claim that their conclusions are at variance to the written constitution despite the widespread belief that that is frequently what justices in the Supreme Court are doing. And the case that comes to mind for me is Home Building and Loan versus Blaisdell, where the Supreme Court narrowly interpreted the Contracts Clause, but still claimed that it was doing so pursuant to the Contracts Clause. So at this point, you're probably wondering, well, what about those facets of constitutional practice that ostensibly at least point beyond the written Constitution? And I'll just give an example of that argument. I think the best place where this argument's at is in a book and a series of articles by Professor Richard Fallon, who's pointed to a number of facets of our practice, which he claims shows that the subject matter of interpretation is more than just the written Constitution. So pointing to non-originalist precedent, pointing to constitutional doctrine that isn't plausibly rooted in the Constitution's original meaning. And then Fallon leverages this descriptive claim to a more powerful claim, which is that in the US, the rule of recognition recognizes more than just the written Constitution. 
So I want to make two moves in response to that. The first move is I want to minimize that objection. What I want to say is that because originalism incorporates some non-originalist precedent and because originalism accepts the existence of constitutional construction, many of the things to which Professor Fallon points to as exemplifying more than the written constitution are in fact required and authorized by the, by the written constitution itself. But my second move is to acknowledge you're right. To some extent, our constitutional practice is internally conflicted. Some facets, like the ones I identified, I think, exemplify the centrality of the written constitution, while others, such as some of those identified by Professor Fallon, expand the subject matter. Now, this is a common phenomenon in human practices. So for those of you like myself who have a family, one of the norms in our family is to treat family members with respect, but unfortunately, that it doesn't always happen that way. The existence of the tension in our constitutional practice does not, by itself, mean that the tension is or should be resolved in Professor Fallon's favor. In other words, the existence of the tension itself doesn't require Professor Fallon's conclusion that our legal practice requires non-originalist practices. Another plausible conclusion, the one that I argue for at length in my essay, is that some fact, facets of our practice are mistaken. And this is, like, this is a likely phenomenon, a likely outcome in a legal practice as complex as ours, operating over so long a period of time with so many different levels of legal conventions, which make it likely that higher order conventions, like our commitment to a written constitution, can come apart from on the ground practices. And in fact, I think that it's one of originalism's virtues that it's able to say or is forced to say, you're right, there are some mistakes in this practice because that makes it ostensibly, it, it acknowledges the, the, the human facet of our, of our practice. And so what I argue at, at length in the essay is that for reasons both internal to our legal practice and external to our practice, the tension should be resolved by affirming the written constitution's centrality. And I'll just give one example of each. I mentioned earlier that the written constitution itself identifies only the written constitution as being the supreme law of the land. That's, a, that, that's an argument in favor of just the written constitution. And I mentioned some of the normative justifications offered by originalists earlier. Those also support identifying the written constitution as the only part of the constitution. So my last part is to say that uh, relying on a relatively thick and relatively controversial conception of law uh, rooted in the Aristotelian tradition, uh, argue that, um, that, that, that this version of narrowing what the Constitution is to just the written Constitution um, also makes sense from that perspective. And because of time constraints, I won't go through it. The basic idea is that I think that there's actually a payoff in identifying, uh, utilizing this relatively thicker uh, conception of law for example, I think that this thicker conception fits well with why we identify the document in the National Archives as our document, as our constitution, as opposed to maybe something that might be better that comes from someplace else. So if you come along with me for the ride thus far, I've argued that originalism's own conceptual commitments, American legal practice, and one type of jurisprudential perspective, the thicker one I mentioned, make the written constitution the sole subject matter of interpretation and therefore excludes the declaration from a unique role in constitutional interpretation. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. I want to focus on your claim that originalists focus on the written constitution as law and ask you about some originalists who argue for the enforceability of unenumerated natural rights. And I suppose the first example would be Akhil Amar, a, a neo-originalist who says that uh, Article 5, which is the part of the constitution that allows amendments, is not exclusive, that it uh, recognizes but doesn't create the right to alter and abolish government, and therefore the people may change their government with methods outside of Article 5. Is Akhil wrong? So I think that from an originalist perspective, the answer to your question would be, it's an empirical question or a historical question. And there's a robust historical debate about whether Amar's hypothesis that Article 5 is not the exclusive way of amending the Constitution, or whether there can also be Ackermanian or like Bruce Ackerman type of non-textual amendments to the Constitution. Um, I happen to fall on the, the side that uh, I think uh, Professor Monahan has uh, argued against Amar's position, and for a whole bunch of reasons that he articulates that I don't have uh, time to here. I think that kind of the general, the, the broader answer to your question is that from the original's perspective, one, because of the fixation thesis, one can only claim to be an originalist and point to unenumerated rights if there's a textual hook somewhere. And so I think Barnett does the best job of this by saying that the Ninth Amendment and the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, those are the textual hooks that say, hey, there's this body of unenumerated stuff that federal judges can import into, into their decision making. 
So uh, speaking of Randy Barnett, um, he uses the Privileges or Immunities Clause to argue for the judicial enforceability of unenumerated rights, including the right, for example, to contract, which he roots in natural law. So he's making a historical claim that the framers did allow for the judicial enforceability of unenumerated rights as long as there's some textual peg. Is he historically correct? Did the framers agree with him that judges should vigorously enforce unenumerated natural rights if they have some textual peg? Boy, that's something that, it, or, on the one hand, I don't want to be cagey and, and, see, and seem like I'm not giving a straight answer, but I think that's actually a virtue, another virtue of originalism, which is that having not done the research to look to all the different ways in which Barnett or people like him could argue that unenumerated rights should, are judicially enforceable, I don't have a, a firm view. I, I do have kind of two tentative views, and so one tentative view is that on the level of the federal government regarding the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, I tend to think that Barnett is right, that there can be, um, uh, that there are enforceable uh, natural law norms. On the state level, I'm less confident of his conclusions. Maybe it's just because of the substantive cash out of his conclusions. So for example, one of the Barnett's claims, um, I think it's in restoring the lost constitution, is that many laws that were in existence in 18, let's say 69, the year after the 14th Amendment was ratified, would be inconsistent with what he claimed the vast majority of the framers and ratifiers thought natural law required. And so I guess I'm at least skeptical of the substance of what he says, although not skeptical of the ultimate conclusion that there are uh, unenumerated, though enforceable, natural rights. Well, just to uh, bring everyone else into the conversation, Bernadette, does it make any sense for Randy Barnett to argue that natural rights should be differently enforced at the federal or state levels? As we were discussing, didn't the framers believe that natural rights bound state and federal governments equally and therefore should be similarly enforceable? Yes, I think that natural rights applied against both the federal and state governments. I, I actually want to just go back to um, Lee's paper for a moment also, just because um, my, my uh, main uh, question for you would be basically, isn't there a big difference between the declaration as a source of interpretation for originalism and something, say, post-ratification. Um, so, I mean, I think that drawing this together with um, Jeff's points about natural rights, that you could see the Declaration as itself a backdrop for interpreting the Constitution and providing a very um, substantive understanding of the natural rights undergirding a constitutional system where you might uh, then say, you know, the Constitution should be interpreted in the spirit of the Declaration, and that that could be um, an originalist perspective, and it wouldn't really uh, cut away from the fixation thesis that you could say, well, the, the meaning is fixed you know, by the time of ratification, but still the Declaration precedes that, and so that was part of the context in which we should be considering the Constitution. Yes, just to be clear, I agree with what you had said, and so what the fixation thesis says is that one looks for the conventional meaning of the text when that text was ratified. So it is clearly the case that, for example, I'm thinking of the Article 4 Republican Guarantee Clause, that when you were, if you were a framer and or ratifier of that clause in 1787 through 1789, you would have the declaration in, in the background of your mind as to what would be a Republican form of government. That would be like one piece of data for that. So I don't think I said anything inconsistent with that. But at the same time, I don't think that that means the declaration is anyway privileged, because I would say the same thing about um, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which preceded the US Constitution, and, and a whole bunch of other uh, historical evidence, Blackstone's commentaries would be another example. Daryl, how would you come down in this conversation? And let me ask, I heard in your comments a prudential concern that if judges can enforce natural rights, they might enforce the wrong ones, because over the course of history, people have invoked natural rights on both sides. Is that prudential question separate from whether natural rights are judicially enforceable? And might you just say, well, we want to correct approach to figuring out what the natural rights are, maybe look to state constitutions to see which rights people over time have considered natural, which in the end would give judges less discretion than just to make them up on their, on their own. Well, I guess I, um, I've got, uh, you know, I've got at least two responses to, to that question. The, the first is that um, we do have a kind of mechanism for translating what might be wide open 
uh, judicially enforceable natural rights norms into a, a positive law, and that is the Section 5 power of the 14th Amendment, the Section 2 power of the 13th Amendment. Um, this is a way, right, of translating what the sentiment of the polity with regard to certain kinds of rights, uh, natural or otherwise, are into affirmative legislation. So, um, you know, to the extent that uh, we have, for example, uh, section 1983, we have Section uh, 1981, Section 1982, and these are ways in which um, what would otherwise be a kind of wild and wooly, you know, natural law, open-ended, underdeterminate set of texts can become more determinate. Um, then, you know, that's one way in which we, you know, we would translate um, the 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 natural law into positive law, and that leads to me to the sort of second observation, which is, you know, well, that means that in terms of the position of the judiciary, right, when the uh, Congress starts using that power to get in the business of sort of figuring out what are our constitutional commitments and what do we really care about, whatever the source, right, whether it's the Declaration or the Virginia, you know, or the you know, Ten Commandments or whatever, that, that there is a certain amount of deference that is owed to the uh, political branches because of the commitments that were made after the Civil War that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sole guardian of uh, natural rights, if you thought about them as natural rights, isn't just the judiciary. A great point, and reminds us accurately that even if you believe that natural rights are legally enforceable, you might not think the judges are the primary definers of them, and as you say, the framers of the 14th Amendment and the Civil War Amendments certainly saw Congress, not the courts, as the primary enforcer. Well, as a law professor, I would love this discussion to go on much longer, but as moderator, we have to follow the most important rule, which is that all panels end on time, so please join me in thanking our panelists. Take a brief break and please return at noon for the next panel.